Okay, we're live. I just need somebody to look at that once in a while to make sure it is live. All right. Are you here to help? No, I need um, your church keys. You need my church keys? To um, um, unlock the door downstairs. Because Dad forgot his keys. Very good, dear. Thank you. Okay, we've been gone for two weeks. We're back. Um, Easter was, well, Resurrection Sunday was one time we were gone, and then I was gone last week. I needed that vacation. Uh, it was a great blessing for me to be able to get away for a few days, especially with everything we've had going on this week. So thank you all for putting up with me, and for those of you who've been watching on Facebook, we're, we're going to start Chapter 15 tonight, but before we do that, we've got a little bit of review to do, kind of catch us back up to where we were. Uh, we're going to do a little review here real quick, and then I've got some things on the, the paper there that we're going to review that we're going to talk about. We're going to get through the first eight verses tonight, Chapter 15. Um, if you remember back in the seals, uh, Revelation Chapter 6 was the seven seals. We saw a preview of the wrath of the Lamb. Uh, in chapter 6, verse 17, and then chapter 7, all of God's people were accounted for or sealed. Then in Revelation 8 through 9, we saw the seven trumpet judgments. We only saw six of them, because the seventh comes later here. Uh, there were two terrors, where the demons came up out of the abyss and started attacking all the people, and they were the people who were not sealed by God, uh, so that God could try to use that to, to get people to turn back towards him. And then in Revelations 10 through 12, we saw the two witnesses, uh, which is the church witnessing to the world. We got involved with the seventh trumpet where Satan came out and was overcome by the angels and cast down from heaven. But in his stepping aside and being cast down, the Antichrist and the false prophet came on the scene with false worship that included every aspect of society, religion, economics, all those things. Okay? And anybody that didn't bow or get sealed by the Antichrist was tortured or killed, um, if they could be. And then in Revelation 14, where we finished two weeks ago, we see a new song in heaven that God's people are starting to sing to glorify and honor God, even as the harvest of God's wrath begins. So we were at the threshold, and then we keep hearing about this wrath, and then when, when we saw the seven trumpets and the two terrors and all that, we were actually there watching it happen, and tonight we're going to have another little interlude. It's amazing how we have all these little interludes in between all this evil stuff that's going on in the world, um, but we're just right up to the last plagues. I mean, we're to the end, and the wrath of God is going to happen, and as the wrath of God happens, there's going to be nothing else, and then Jesus is going to come back, so... Now, there's some extra papers there, guys. Okay. Everybody caught up to speed on where we've been. That's a, just a quick view through where we've been over the last several weeks. And now we're going to go to your paper, and we're going to do a few things. We're going to talk about the, a review of the truths of the revelation of Jesus through John. The truths. Okay? These are the events. Boom, 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 boom. Let's talk about the truths. Truths and events can be the same thing, but sometimes the events need to be explained just a little bit. All right, there's a vibrant sense of the majesty of God and the worthiness and significance of Jesus' sacrifice. That's where we see the picture of worship in heaven in chapter 4 and chapter 5. Um, this book is about worshiping God, and it happens to be about those who worship God versus those who refuse to worship God. Okay? And John wrote this book to churches that were being persecuted because they worship God. And he's offering hope all along the line. But, you know, even as we talked about this morning, and I'm sure somebody disagreed with me, you cannot worship God unless you have an active worship relationship with God. And the only way you can have a relationship with God is to be drawn by God, called by God, made holy by God, and given God's glory. That's how, you, that's how you have a relationship to worship God. Okay? And as we see this, there's a strong, strong emphasis on worship. That's the next blank there. A strong emphasis on worship. Let's just go back one 
real quick to chapter 4. I'll, just, uh, I'll read it to you. It says, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord our God, the Almighty, the one who always was, who is, and who is still to come. You are worthy, O Lord our God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and they existed because you uh, created what you pleased. That's worship of God the Father. And then we see worship of Jesus. Uh, a little further over in chapter 5, it says, You are worthy to take the scroll and break its seals and open it, for you were slaughtered, and your blood ransomed the people of God. Every tribe, every language, every people, every nation. And you have caused them to become a kingdom of priests for our God, and they will reign on the earth. Worthy is the Lamb who was slaughtered to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Blessing and glory and honor and power belong to the one sitting on the throne and to the Lamb forever. You think that's a little bit of an emphasis on worship? Maybe? Yes. Yeah. You know, it's the opposite of what we hear in most songs today. Most Christian songs are about me, me, I, I, poor, poor, me, me, boo, boo, me, boo, boo. God, you got to fix me. God, you got to help me. It's all right if I'm not all right. You know, and it's not focused on God and worship of God. God expects us to come to him in our brokenness. Not worried about our brokenness, but trying to find him. Because when we find him, our brokenness is healed. Does that make sense to everybody? When we seek God, He fixes us. But we just can't sit around and say, Oh God, can't you make it better? Oh God, fix this. Oh God, you know, and, and, and the, 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 the love songs to Jesus that are really Jesus is my girlfriend songs got to go. They've got to go. Okay, there's an imperative for the true church to take a stand against every manifestation of evil. The true church has to take a stand. That was Revelation chapter 11 where the witnesses were. Okay? It says, they, when they completed their testimony in verse 7, the beast that comes up out of the bottomless pit will declare war on them. Do you hear that? Will declare. This is not past history. This is something that's going to happen. <coughs> will declare war on them and kill them, and their bodies will lie in the main street of Jerusalem, the city that is figuratively called Sodom and Egypt, the city where their Lord was crucified. Okay? People will give their lives for the cause of Christ. It happens all over the world. It just doesn't happen here yet. But I believe it's going to happen here because every day, every day, evil makes a stronger climb and gets a deeper foothold in our world. And God is pushed aside and pushed back. And, you know, we, uh, we know what happened when the Cold War was going on when Russia was in charge of the whole Eastern Bloc of Europe. We know what was going on there. The church grew because the people were persecuted and they were hiding and they were giving their lives to the cause of Christ. And ever since Russia, and they tore the wall down and Russia became less a power, they've become like Western Americans and Western Europeans. They, God's not that important anymore. And, you know, as we look around, there's no, there's no hunger and thirsting for God. Well, when the only hope that you have is for God to help you, you'll seek God. And there are people who have given their lives for Christ. There are people in, in the world today who are giving their lives for Christ. And up until Jesus comes back, more and more and more people are going to give their lives for Christ. You know, we take it for granted here in the United States that we still do have some freedom to worship. Now, if you say things people out there in the world don't like, they'll try to shut you down. But I don't care. I'm going to say what God wants us to say, and we're going to read God's Word the way it's written, and we're not going to psychologically change it for anybody to make them feel better about themselves. So it's one of those, here it is, deal with the things. That makes sense to everybody? Yes. And that's what causes, that's what causes persecution, because people don't like that. Now, there is a strong separation between true and false worship and believers. And here we have it, right here in chapter 13. When the Antichrist comes on the scene, and the false prophet begins to talk about the Antichrist, and they build a statue to the Antichrist, and they cause people to fall down and worship, and everybody has to get a mark, or they cannot have transactions. They can't buy things and sell things and go places. When that happens, true believers are really going to be persecuted. Because you cannot serve Christ and serve the world. As a matter of fact, it says in the Bible that anybody that's a friend of the world is an enemy of God. 
And that's why we have to be different from everybody else. That's why we're called the chosen, the called out ones. Uh, we're to live in the world, but not live like the world lives. And these people, they're living like the world lives, and they want food, and they want whatever they want. They're going to they're gonna sign up to whatever program they have to sign up to, even if it's for the end of their soul. Uh, because anybody who chooses not to be sealed by Christ automatically chooses to be sealed by the Antichrist. Okay? They seal their own destiny by refusing Christ. And really, that's blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. When, in the true form of blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is to refuse God's grace, God's mercy, God's love, and God's salvation because that's what disqualifies people from heaven. Right? And so... As time goes on, more and more and more and more and more people are going to refuse God because the way is narrow and people don't want to go on the narrow route. You know, think about all the towns that dried up since they put in the interstate system in the United States. Beautiful little thriving towns. Now they're gone. Nothing left. Because the highway goes by too fast. And people would rather go on the highway really fast than to take their time and meander through and find what's there. And that's what happens to a lot of people. You know, um, I, I was accosted by a drunk woman yesterday at Rachel's bridal, or at the, at the reception. Three times. She just kept getting up in my face. Mumble, 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 saying this, saying that. And I finally just had to say, you know what, I'll talk to you sometime when you're not drunk. You know, people don't care. They just do what they do. And, pe- and, and her part of her argument was, when I was a kid, I went to church on Sunday morning and Sunday night and Wednesday night and blah, blah, blah. And that. now she's so drunk she can't even hardly stand up. So it must not have helped. Right? Going to church must not help. The church must not have been a church that preached the gospel. There must not have been anybody that helped her find Jesus. Because now she's living like God doesn't exist, even though she wants to fall back on that. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I didn't do anything to ask for that, but I got it. And I finally just had to leave Rachel's reception because I couldn't. Every time I walked through somewhere, she was right there in front of me. She just kept getting in my face. You know, and people are going to do that to somebody who's a believer. They're going to do that. Okay. Um, We also see a picture of the church besieged and protected by Christ. What do I mean besieged? What happens when something's under siege? You military guys who've been in the, in the military, what's that mean? Taken over. Not necessarily taken over, but under complete attack to where all you got's what you got and you can't get something else to help you out. Okay? Everything's contained, you're surrounded. There's no way to send out a runner to get water, no way to send out a runner to get food, you're under attack. And we talked about that this morning, didn't we? that the attack that we're under is an unseen attack. It's not visible. Everything that's going on in our world today is being orchestrated by evil, guys. What's going on in the Ukraine is orchestrated by evil. What's going on here in our country with one state after another state after another state passing these abortion laws is being orchestrated by evil. Critical race theory and all those things that are being taught in our classrooms are being orchestrated by evil to try to cause division. Marxism trying to take over our country is orchestrated by evil. Okay, And so as we think about that, there's an understanding that the church will be persecuted and will suffer for the preaching of the truth of God's word. I don't know how many different ways I can say it. If we continue to preach the truth of God's word, we can just expect that somebody's going to be against us. Okay? And it's not always Satan. Why? How do we know it's not always Satan? Because he's only in one place at one time. Right? Sometimes it's people. And I explained that to you this morning, that if you start telling somebody about Jesus and they get all agitated, it's because the Spirit of God working in you is fighting against the spirit of evil inside of them. And they just can't stand it. They can't put up with it. And they feel conviction. And so we want to make sure that we continue to show the world that we love them but we have to stand for God's principles in the process. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, There's an emphasis that history is moving towards a divine destiny. Divine destiny means God's going to win. Ultimately, it's all going to be over and God's going to win. Turn to Philippians, if you would. Chapter 1, 
verse 16. Philippians 1, 16. It says, actually let's back up just a little bit there. Um, let's start in verse 12. I want you to know, my dear brothers and sisters, that everything that's happened to me has helped to spread the good news. For everyone here, including the whole palace guard, knows that I am in chains because of Christ. So Paul was preaching to his captives, or captors. Does that make sense? He was telling everybody about Jesus, even the guards. And because of my imprisonment, most of the believers here have gained confidence and boldly speak the message without fear. It's true, some are speaking out of jealousy and rivalry, but others preach about Christ with pure motives. They preach because they love me, for they know I have been appointed to defend the good news. What does the church exist for? To witness the lost people and defend the good news. That's what we exist for, and to worship God, right? Those things that we've already talked about. There's also a realistic understanding of the existence and power of evil, and we talked about that very extensively between chapter 11 and chapter 13, as we talked about the terrors being unleashed, and we talked about Satan fighting and, and being overcome, and then the Antichrist and the false prophet coming on the scene. We talked about that very much in depth the last couple of weeks. So <coughs> the power of evil is real in our world. Would you agree with that? Yes. yes. It's real. Okay? Um, also, the, there's a look at the spirit of, as, as well as real Antichrist and the ultimate, its ultimate evil power. Again, that's 11 through 13. Uh, there's a promise that God will destroy every manifestation of evil. Evil's going to be overcome by God. The realistic understanding of the existence of power of what was that? Mm -hmm. The existence and power of evil. evil. Chapter 11 through 13. And there's a promise that God will destroy every manifestation of evil. There's an absolute assurance of the triumph for Christ and the martyrs and for all believers. Everybody that follows Jesus is going to be victorious. Okay? Everybody that follows Jesus is going to be victorious. There's an absolute assurance of the triumph for Christ, the martyrs, and all believers because God's going to destroy every manifestation of evil. Okay? Now, that brings us up to chapter 15. Through chapter 16, we're going to break this down into two parts, okay? Chapter 15, verse 1, starts out and says, I saw in heaven another marvelous event of great significance, okay? So, we are not going to see the plague yet, although the seventh trumpet is blown, okay? We've seen some of the things, we've seen the great wrath of God that's about to happen, but we're going to see what happens here. This is the last series of seven that we're going to look at. The, there's a continued fulfillment of the woes that started in 617 right there. Um, the seventh seal, which is chapter 8, 1 through 2, contains the seven trumpets. And the seventh trumpet, chapter 14, 11, 14 through 15, contains the seven bowls of wrath. And these are the last plagues that are talked about in Matthew 24, 29. I'll read that to you real quick. Matthew 24, 29. Matthew 24, verse 29. Immediately after the anguish of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will give no light, the stars will fall from the sky, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. <clears throat> now, let's look at Revelation 6, 17 real quick. I'll turn there. You don't have to. I'll read it to you. Uh, you're welcome to if you want to. It says, The great day of the wrath of the Lamb and the one who sits on the throne has come who is able to survive. And as we watch that in chapter 12, or verse 12, it says, I watched as the lamb broke the sixth seal, there was a great earthquake. The sun became dark as black cloth, the moon became red as blood. The stars fell from the sky to the earth like green figs falling from a tree shaken by a strong wind. The sky was rolled up like a scroll, and all the mountains and the islands were moved from their places. That's exactly what Jesus is talking about. That's what's going to happen when these last seven plagues that we're going to be looking at in the next this week and next week um, begin to manifest. <coughs> now, 
up to this point, Jesus has not returned yet. Remember? We've not seen anywhere where Jesus returned. Now, our brothers and sisters who believe that everybody's going to be taken out before all this nastiness happens, believe that happened way back in chapter 4, before anything like this happened. But we've never seen anywhere in the book of Revelation where it says Jesus came back yet. Never. Okay? Um, and so, as we begin to read this, there's going to be this celestial interlude. This is the next blanks. The celestial interlude before the bowls of wrath. And I want to read just a minute out of chapter 14 where it talks about the imminent, undiluted, righteous wrath and judgment of God. Let's look at 14, 9 through 10. Then a third angel followed them, shouting, Anyone who worships the beast and his statue, or accepts his mark on the forehead or on the hand, must drink the wine of God's anger. It has been poured out full strength into God's cup of wrath, and they will be tormented with fire and burning sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and the Lamb. The smoke of their torment will rise forever and ever, and they will have no relief day or night, for they have worshipped the beast and the statue and have accepted the mark of his name. Think about that for a minute. Everyone who refuses God, everyone who refuses to be sealed by the Holy Spirit, is going to face that torment forever and ever and ever and ever. There's no good people in the world. I said that this morning. Everyone has fallen short of the glory of God. The only way to remedy that is to repent and have a relationship with Jesus Christ. But you know, repentance is something that's not in the church anymore. A lot of churches don't talk about repenting. They don't talk about being born again. They don't talk about being broken before God and, you know, just giving everything to God. And they don't read chapter 8 of Romans where it says, that when we're praying to God and we're so broken before God and we don't know what to say, the Holy Spirit conveys our thoughts to God in words that we can't even understand. I tell you guys, it breaks my heart sometimes on Sunday morning to stand in front of Cumberland Community Church. I wish all of you could stand up there when we're singing songs like Cornerstone and Grace Flows Down and people are just standing there like this. Not effective, not singing. Not participating. How can you be in God's presence where there's worship like that and not be affected? It happens everywhere I go. Every church I've ever been to, there are people who do not. Well, I can't sing. Well, God says make a joyful noise. I don't have any rhythm. I can't clap. But let me tell you, I've been in churches before where everybody was clapping to a different beat. You know, don't be afraid to raise your hands to the Lord and worship Him and surrender to Him. That's what worship is all about. And if we are stingy with our worship of God, how close are we to God? Does that make sense? Because when the Bible says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, all your strength, doesn't that mean everything that makes you who you are? And if you're in love with somebody with everything that makes you who you are, it ought to be evident as you're interacting with that, right? And so, you know, I know different people have different personalities, but I still know that standing like this, not looking or looking down or not participating at all, is not worshiping God. It's not. Um, and I've had people yell at me for saying stuff like that before. <coughs> no, the Bible says, raise holy hands before the Lord. It says, play an instrument before God. David danced before God. You know, we have the ability to worship God, and one day we're going to worship God. We should be practicing here. Make sense? And here's the deal, though. In chapter 14, it says, everybody who refuses to be sealed by God, every one of these people who false worships or doesn't worship or refuses God is going to drink. Look what it says. It says they're going to drink the wine of God's wrath poured out full strength. How many of you drink coffee? How many of you drink it straight and black and dark roast and tough as you can make it? One. 
What do the rest of you do? You put milk in it and sugar in it and skinny syrups in it and change the flavor of it. You can't have coffee. I'm sorry. It still tastes like coffee. I don't care how much stuff you put in it. It tastes like coffee. Right? But when you drink it straight, it's different. And you know, God has been patient and God has been <clears throat> diligent and re trying to reach people, but there's coming a day when the undiluted full strength of God is going to hit this earth and it's going to be wrath. And it says in chapter 14, verse 20, the grapes were trampled in, uh, trampled in the wine press outside the city and the blood flowed from the wine press in a stream about 180 miles long and as high as a horse's bridle. Well, what is that? If you back up there in verse 17, an angel came out from the temple in heaven. He had a sharp signal, and another angel who had the power to destroy with fire came from the altar, and he shouted to the angel with the sharp sickle, Swing your sickle now and gather the clusters of grapes from the vines of the earth, for they are ripe for judgment. That's these people right here. They are going to feel the hammer down, unstoppable, unavoidable, undiluted wrath of God. But if you say things like that, it might offend somebody. Well, I would rather offend somebody and have them think about the possibility of a relationship with Jesus Christ than have to stand in front of God one of these days and say, I just said, the 11th commandment is be nice. Just be nice. Don't tell somebody the truth. Just be nice. I'm going to tell you the truth because I'm responsible to God to tell you the truth. And people who don't want to talk about the end, and people who don't want to talk about the book of Revelation, and people who soft soaked it to the point where only the bad people are going to be here when all hell breaks loose. And, you know, why do we need to even know what's going on if we're not going to be here so we can help people get their way through to Christ? How are we going to act? Why do we need to know about it? Right? And the sealed, the 144,000, is mentioned in chapter 7. And then it talks about the great group that's before God's throne in chapter 7. And then in chapter 14, it talks again about those in that little interlude there who are going to be singing a brand new song in heaven that the angels are teaching them to worship God. <coughs> okay? So all through this book, John is showing us if we stay faithful, which is what exactly what Jesus said as he wrote the letters to all seven churches, to him who perseveres to the end, I will give this, 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 and this. Right? John is just building on what Jesus said. And again, we said that all of these things, whether it be the seals or the trumpets or the bowls that are coming, it's the same thing being talked about, just a little bit more magnified so that we can see it. And we see that it's even worse than what we see when we first encounter it. Okay? Now, here we go. Chapter 15, verses 1 through 4. Let's read it. Then I saw in heaven another marvelous event of great significance. Seven angels were holding the seven last plagues, which would bring God's wrath to completion. Again, they haven't dumped them yet. He sees them standing there. They're ready to dump them. Okay? Why would John warn anybody about that? Because these are the seven last plagues. Once this happens, there is no chance. No chance for anybody to repent. No chance for anybody to have a relationship with Christ. Which would bring God's wrath to completion. I saw before me what seemed to be a sea of glass mixed with fire. And on it stood all the people who had been victorious over the beast and his statue and the number representing his name. They were all holding harps that God had given them, and they were singing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb. Great and marvelous are your works, O Lord God the Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the nations. Who will not fear you, Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship before you for your righteous mm -hmm. deeds have been revealed. What did we read this morning? God has done what? We said there's no evolution because we saw in Hebrews chapter 11, 
Let me go there real quick. <coughs> Hebrews chapter 11, verse 3 says, By faith we understand that the entire universe was formed at God's command, and what we see did not come from anything that, we, that can be seen. Okay? And right here it says that why will people not fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship before you, for your righteous deeds have been revealed. There's no excuse for anybody in the world not to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. <clears throat> There's been enough TV programs on, enough shortwave radio, enough regular radio programs, enough Christian songs broadcast across this world that there's no refute, there's no excuse for anybody in the world not to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. The only people that don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ are the ones that don't want one. Okay? But there are people out there that don't want one that don't know why they don't want one. And that's why we're here. To help them understand who Jesus <laughs> is and why we live for Christ. And why they need Christ in their life. That's why we're here. Okay? Now, some people talk about predestination to the point where God already knows who's going to be saved. Why would we waste our time talking to people? Because if they're not going to be saved, there's nothing we can do to help them to get saved. Oh. Hmm. That's called hyper-Calvinism. Hyper-Calvinism says if God wants them saved, God will save them. But what did Jesus say in Matthew 28, 19 through 20? Wherever you go, make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Right? Peter said, always be willing to give a reason for the hope that lies within you with gentleness and respect so people can understand why there's a God. You see, ultimately, God does know who's all going to be his if they choose the contingency to be his. Does that make sense? Because God's plan for every contingency. And those who say yes, and those who surrender, and those whose sins are forgiven, and those who surrender to the Lordship of Jesus Christ will be saved. But also, those four things, plus they have to persevere to the end. It's not a start the race and end the race and stop. And just pretend like you have a fire insurance policy in your pocket. You know, that's where the argument comes in, the once saved, always saved, and and losing your salvation. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 5, whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son does not have life. I've written these things that you might know that you have life. Okay? We also know that salvation is a free gift from God, and we can't give it up if we have it. Because what did Jesus say this morning in John chapter 6? Of those the Father gives me, I'll not lose one, but I'll raise them all on the last day. You see, we look at this and we see many people in our world who know just enough about religion and just enough about church to think they're okay. And we have just enough preachers out there who are not willing to offend people with the truth of the gospel who will tell them they're okay. We have people like Joel Osteen who won't say that homosexuality is a sin that disqualifies people from heaven. We have people out there saying that there are multiple ways to get to heaven besides just through Jesus who said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. Right? And what that does is it makes Christianity a very exclusivistic religion in a very pluralistic world. How many of you would go to a restaurant that only served one thing? What do we want? Choices. We want choices. We want variety. We want different things. God doesn't change what he says just because we want to hear something different. God doesn't make people feel good about themselves when they're not living for him because the Holy Spirit, Jesus said in John chapter 14 and John chapter 16, comes to convict us into the ways of righteousness to help us understand what God wants. That's why we have to make sure that we understand what's going to happen at the end because there are going to be people that are searching when all hell breaks loose on this earth. They're going to be trying to decide, do I stay where I am or do I, while I still have a chance, or do I have a chance to have a relationship with Jesus Christ? When we get down to these bowls of plagues, that's it. There's no more chances. No more chances. None. Zero. Okay? Think about that. No chances. What's it like to pull up to a restaurant that you used to go to, but got shut down in COVID? 
We don't know a lot about that because a lot of the restaurants around here made it through because people in Cumberland, if they won't do anything else, they go out and eat. Mm-hmm. Right? But there are a lot, of, about a third or better, almost 45% really, of all small business restaurants especially went out of business during COVID because of all the laws and stuff like that. And there's nothing like pulling up to your favorite restaurant. I meet somebody on, on every other Monday, and we go to the place where we normally meet, and the sign said, closed for lack of help. You know? One of these days, these people are going to be looking for answers. Because when evil is unleashed, and the Antichrist is demanding worship, they're going to want something else. Because they're going to find out that Believing in God isn't as bad as what they thought it would be. If the church is gone, if God's people are gone, if all the witness for God is gone, how are they going to find Christ? Some people would say, well, they're just going to go to the churches and pick up the Bibles and find Christ. No, they're not. If they were going to do that, they'd do it right now. Because Satan's always going to have something false. He's always going to have some excuse for people not to have a relationship with God. He's going to try to take as many people as he can from God through what's going on. And let me tell you what, we read in John, 1 John, that the, the spirit of Antichrist has been alive and on the earth ever since the very first century. And Satan is a liar and the father of lies. He's the accuser of the brethren. He'll do everything he can to try to keep us from worshiping God. And he'll do everything he can to make us believe that we can't help somebody else because we're not fixed yet. You know the day I'm going to be fixed? Be the day I breathe my last breath and I stand before Jesus healed. Perfect in every way. Just the way he is. Not before then. Doesn't stop me from trying to help people understand that there's a God that loves them. And that hell is real. And hell is hot. And eternity lasts for a long time. And those who live in sin will reap the wages of sin. And the wages of sin is death for eternity. Death for eternity. And you know, when we start looking at that and we start thinking about the people that we know and love, we we have to struggle. So what we have here in verses 1 through 4 is another depiction of the coming of Christ in relation to the destruction of anti-Christian system. All right, verse 1, the angels are holding the last plagues, but they have not dumped them out yet. In verse 2, the victorious, the faithful, and the elect of God sing a song of worship in heaven. We could sing that song right now, couldn't we? Look at what it says. Great and marvelous are your works, O Lord, God the Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the nations. Who will not fear you, Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are worthy and holy. All nations will come and worship before you, for your righteous deeds have been revealed. Think about it. There are people from every tongue and tribe and nation and language that worship God now. Some places it's a very small group. Okay? Some people are laying their lives down today, every day, because they believe in Christ. Every day, they stand in fear of death. Go to China and stand on the, preachers, on the corner and start preaching the gospel. Go to Mecca and stand underneath the big tower there where Muhammad's buried and start preaching the gospel of Christ and see how long you keep your head on your shoulders. Right? But there's people there living undercover, talking about Jesus, putting their lives on the line every day to win someone for Christ. When we went to the Philippines several years ago, we worked with a man there who works with uh, a group of people that are Muslim in the Philippines. And here's what they do. When somebody becomes a Christian, they'll find a 55-gallon barrel and fill it up with water and baptize them and they make sure they have centuries out everywhere, making sure nobody knows what they're doing. Because that person becomes a believer in Jesus Christ. Because as soon as they do it, they're automatically disowned by their family. They're automatically put on the, on the list of those who can be either tortured or killed because they've left their faith in Allah. We don't know anything about that stuff. We don't. And I'm going to tell you what, God may put us in a position, and he says, it says in Matthew, if you'll remember, that unless God cut those days short, even the very elect would be affected by it. The ones who truly belong to God would begin to question everything. That's why, that's where it's going to come down to the rubber meets the road, who's a real believer and who's not. When all hell breaks loose on the earth, and we've got to stand up for Christ in the midst of 
Well, we'll cut your head off if that's what it takes. We'll kill you. We'll do whatever we've got to do. Because we're not going to stand by and watch you preach the gospel of Christ when we don't have anybody to worship the beast and the false prophet and communism and Marxism and all the atheistic tendencies and things that are out there in the world right now. I've been reading the history of the United States up around the beginning of the Revolutionary War. And do you know those few people who signed the Declaration of Independence put their lives and their livelihoods on the line for this dream that is America? Because they were to be hung as traitors if anybody could catch them and find them. And that's exactly what's going to happen when the Antichrist and the false prophet are busy. Anybody who in any way refuses to do what they want they are going to be killed. But look at what it says here. It says that these people in verse one or in verse two, I saw before me what seemed like a pale glass sea mixed with fire, and on it stood all the people who had been victorious over the beast and his statue and the number representing his name. What's the number representing his name? Six six six. Remember. And they were all holding harps that God had given them, and they were singing the song of Moses, the servant of God, the song of the Lamb. Man, what a picture of being with Jesus after you've been through hell on earth. Isn't that amazing? There's hope there. There's positive stuff there. We know that God's never going to leave us or forsake us, and we see it right there. In verses 3 through 4, this song... Of, the, of Moses and the Lamb is very similar in theme with Exodus chapter 15. Let's turn back to Exodus chapter 15. What did we say about the book of Revelation when we first started talking about the plagues and things like that? Very similar to Exodus, right? Let's look at chapter 15, and we're going to look at verses 1 through 2. It says, Moses and all the people sang this song to the Lord. I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. He's hurled both the horse and the rider into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song. He's given me victory. This is my God, and I will praise him, my Father's God, and I will exalt him. You hear that? The, the worship of God. And then we look at verses 6 through 7. And it says, Your right hand, O Lord, is glorious in power. Your right hand, O Lord, smashes the enemy. In the greatness of your majesty, you overthrow those who rise against you. You unleash your blazing fury. It consumes them like straw. Remember what's going on? The evil people are getting ground up in the, in the wine press of God's wrath. Just like when the Egyptians were following the Israelites through the Red Sea and God allowed the water to collapse on them as the last foot came out of the water or out of the ground that belonged to the people of Israel. And the Egyptians were fast on their tracks and God collapsed those two walls of water and drowned them all. Okay? And then we look at verses 11 through 13. It says, Who is like you among the gods, O Lord, glorious in holiness, awesome in splendor, performing great wonders? You raised your right hand, and the earth swallowed our enemies. And then verses 17 through 18, You will bring them in and plant them on your own mountain, the place, O Lord, reserved for your own dwelling, the sanctuary, O Lord, that your hands have established. The Lord will reign forever and ever. And then we see this version of that song in chapter 15. Great and marvelous are your works, O Lord, the God Almighty, just and true are your ways, King of the nations, who will not fear you, Lord, and glorify your name. For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship before you. All the righteous deeds, all your righteous deeds have been revealed. So as we see this, it's a song about God's judgment, not redemption. That song in, in Exodus is not about God saving the people. It's about God destroying his enemy who had them under their thumb for 400 years. Does that make sense to everybody? And what we're seeing in this song right here, it says God is going to continue to make his righteous deeds happen. Now think about that. If God is righteous and his will is going to be done on the world, what's that mean? It means everything evil is going to be destroyed. 
and those who choose to be marked by the false prophet in the in chapter 14, it says, they will be tormented day and night forever in the presence of the Lamb and the angels. But it doesn't say in the presence of those who were tormented by them. That's how we know that we can't see what's going on from heaven. Because none of us would want to see anybody, even the evil people in the world who've done horrible things like Pol Pot, Stalin, Hitler, you know, name them, Saddam Hussein. We wouldn't want to even see what they're going to go through. And it says they're going to be tortured day and night in front of the Lamb and the angels. We're not going to see that torture. We're not going to see the, the brokenness of people if we're already with Christ. Does that make sense to everybody? And there we find hope again that God, when he removes evil, we're not going to be worried about it because we're already going to be in his presence. Okay? Now, the persecuted church will witness the victorious return of Christ. The persecuted church will witness the victorious return of Christ, and true believers will rule and reign with Christ. <coughs> you know, this is one of those places where people get that goofy idea that we just sit around on clouds playing harps. The Hollywood idea of what it means to go to heaven. The harps are for worship. Right? The song is for worship. The attitude is an attitude of worship. And ultimately, we will worship God forever. And somebody says, oh, that's going to be boring. Just sitting around worshiping God. Oh, I don't think so. If you've ever truly had a period or a session of worship with God... And he's touched your heart in a deep, deep way. Man, you don't want to ever have that go away. You don't want it to stop. He's fine. Um, you don't want that to go away. You know, I long for those moments when I can get absolutely as close to God as what I can get. Sometimes for me, that's sitting out in the woods just praying and thinking and talking. Sometimes it's when I'm sitting in my camp when I go do the reenactment stuff. And ignoring everything that's going around me as I sit there and read my Bible and, and journal and talk to God. Well, I got my smoke blowing in on me out of my little campfire, or I got a you know pot of water on the on the brazier getting hot so I can make myself a cup of tea because I don't drink coffee. Um, and just sitting there at night looking up at the stars and saying, "My God, look what you did, and you still care about me." You know, when you think about that, the one who put the stars there and knows the name of every star, the one who made the earth spin just at the right volume of energy, who tilted it just exactly the same way so we don't burn up or freeze, who sends the weather and sends the seasons, cares enough about us that Jesus came and died on the cross so that we can have salvation. And guys, we need to do everything that we can to help all the lost people that we don't understand that. We've got to find a way to do it. We've got to find a way to do it. And the old Billy Graham kind of crusade is not getting it done anymore. We, I fought the other night for our group of people and some other folks who want to have a youth camp this summer. And there was money sitting in this account that was for youth camp, but they decided they weren't going to do youth camp anymore with the group that was doing it before. And so we petitioned them for the money to start a youth camp. Do you know that Cumberland Community Church is the only church out of 21 churches, Southern Baptist churches in Allegheny and Garrett County and Mineral County that have a youth group? We're the only church out of the Southern Baptist churches in Allegheny, Garrett, and Mineral County, Northern Mineral County that have a youth group. Even the bigger churches like ones up at Garrett Deep Creek, they don't have a youth group. And so they don't care about kids. And we had somebody who said, well, we can't give them that money because what if we want to do something later? Well, if you want to do something with it, you'd have done something with it. And, well, nobody, this church doesn't have a youth group. Where are we going to get all these kids? It used to be we used to send our youth group kids. We said, we don't want youth group kids. We'll find lost kids and get them to camp. We'll find a way. Well, parents don't send their kids to camp anymore. I'll guarantee you if you make the price right and it lasts for a week, parents will send their kids to camp just to get rid of them. And they'll find Jesus. 
And we're not going to force him on them, but we will educate them about him so that they have the opportunity to accept Jesus as their Savior. We'll do that. And there was one person who just kept trying to kill it. And I just finally said, listen, keep your money. Or give it up. Because it's not your money, it's God's money. And if that money was set aside to reach kids, it's not reaching kids in the bank and the, and the, the group that you're a part of is not a savings loan institution. God's money was given. A lot of that money is from camper fees that were given when kids went to camp. Because you have to have a little seed money to start with. And we already have a full staff in place to do this camp. A full staff, including a nurse, including a, a dietitian, including the people to cook the food, including a place to have it right up at Myersdale, Camp Camille. And they're going to say, well, no. Well, guess what? Out of the eight people that I was in that meeting with, seven of them said, let's do it, and one kept saying no. You know what? We're going to have camp in July. For nine-year-olds to 18-year-olds, and we're going to talk to them about Jesus. It'll be eight. Well, we're going to do it this year as a practice run, and we'll see what happens next year. And they said, well, why would, we want, why would we want to give you all the money? What if it doesn't work out? They've already decided God can't do it. And you know, that's these people that I'm talking about who have religion, but they don't have Christ in their life. If they had Christ in their life, they would spend their own money to get kids to camp. I know an old man when we lived in Missouri... His son took all of his money away from him except his Social Security check. He owned a 500 acre farm and he would send upwards of 70 to 80 kids a year to youth camp. I was, one, I was the assistant director of that youth camp. And his son thought that he was foolishly spending his money. So you know what he did? He started spending his Social Security money to send kids to camp. And in 25 years, over 300 kids came to know Christ because of an old man who was 91 when he died, burned up in his own car, sitting in his driveway because gas was leaking, and he hit the gas and the ignition and it sparked and blew up. What a way to go for a guy who did all that, huh? But I'm going to tell you what, he's with Jesus, and I know that for sure. He spent his own money. And you know what his son did? He sold the farm. He's not even on the farm anymore. He sold it. So he was just trying to keep his dad from doing something good. And people who follow the Antichrist, who worship Satan, even though they don't do it overtly, they will do whatever they can to stop people from hearing about the gospel. And those are the people that are taking charge in our country right now. They are the loudest voices, even though they are the smallest minority. They are the ones who are dictating what's going to happen in the world today. Because God's people just sit around and keep their mouth shut. We don't want to offend anybody. We don't want our neighbors and our, our relatives to be mad at us because we talk to them about Jesus. Because everybody knows when you're growing up, what your parents tell you, when you go to a family reunion, don't talk about God and don't talk about government. Right? Well, as we look at this, 5 through 8 in chapter 15, the glory of God is revealed as the angels receive the seven bowls with the plagues of wrath. Now think about that. God's glory is revealed as these bowls of wrath are being handed out. Let's look at what it says. Then I looked and saw the temple in heaven. God's tabernacle was thrown wide open. The seven angels who were holding the seven plagues came out of the temple. They were clothed in spotless white linen with gold sashes across their chests. Then one of the four living beings handed each of the seven Angels, a bowl filled with the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. The temple was filled with smoke from God's glory and power. No one could enter the temple until the seven angels had completed pouring out the seven plagues. Do you hear that? Nobody's getting into heaven until those plagues are poured. <coughs> the temple is shut until the plagues are poured out. We're at the very end. So as we look at this, the door to the temple is open again. The first time we saw it open was in chapter 11, verse 19, where it said, 
Uh, it's time to judge, or let's see. Then in heaven the temple of God was opened and the ark of his covenant could be seen inside the temple. Lightning flashed and thunder crashed and roared and there was an earthquake and a terrible hailstorm. And that is after the two witnesses have been taken into heaven. And that is at, at right before the, the story of the woman and the dragon, which is the story we said of old history where Satan has tried to stop God's work and tried to stop Jesus and those kind of things and stop the church. So we see that picture of the temple, and now we see the temple again. The doors open. The seven angels come out of the temple to deliver God's holy, just, and righteous will. Think about that with me. Don't we just want to hear about a loving God? Don't we just want to hear about a gracious God? Don't we just want to... Grandpa God with the big old white beard that we can crawl up in his lap and everything goes away and all the parent <laughs> stuff goes away and you know mom says that kid needs a beating and Grandpa God says oh poor baby you know he, he'll get it right the next time um, that's not who God is you see God is loving and God is 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 gracious and he's merciful but he is also just righteous and holy. And God can't love without being just. His justice is not superseded by his love. You understand that? His mercy and his grace is not superseded by his or is not superseded by his righteousness and his holiness. Right? He is all those things loving, holy, righteous, just, gracious, merciful. <coughs> And you can't have the three you like because they're the easy three, the nice three, without having the disciplinary part, right? God is not a good parent to some people and the fun parent and the disciplinary parent to other people. He's just not. Do you know that God loves the most horrible sinner as much as he loves us who belong to him? There are no degrees of God's love when it comes to people. Now, we receive the blessings of following God, but God loves the most vile sinner. Jesus died for the most vile sinner. And do you know, without Christ, we are all vile sinners. And sometimes we begin to look at ourselves and we begin to compare ourselves with other people. And the Bible says, don't compare yourself to anybody else. Do what God wants you to do, and then you can have the satisfaction of knowing you did what you're supposed to. And if we're really going to compare ourselves to anybody, who should it be? Jesus. Let me tell you what. I'm coming up on the short end of the stick on that one every time. But I want to be like him. And I want to adjust my life to be like his. And it's only God's spirit that helps me to make that happen. So as we see this happening, these seven angels come out and they deliver God's holy, just, and righteous will. And in verse 8, the smoke filling the temple is representative of God's holy presence. And again, we go back to Exodus chapter 13. Exodus chapter 13. This is when the people have left Egypt. They're going through the desert. And here's what we see. Exodus chapter 13, verses 20 through 22. It says this. The Israelites left Succoth and camped at Etham on the edge of the wilderness. The Lord went ahead of them. He guided them during the day with a pillar of cloud and he provided light at night with a pillar of fire. This allowed them to travel by day or by night. And the Lord did not remove the pillar of cloud or the pillar of fire from his place in front of the people. Do you hear that? And then it says back where we were in Revelation, you can see that the temple was filled with smoke. Smoke and cloud, very similar, right? It talks about the presence of God. And then verse chapter 13 of Exodus, verses, or chapter 24, verse 16. Go to chapter 24, verse 16 in Exodus. 24, 16. It says this. To the Israelites at the foot of the mountain, the glory of the Lord appeared at the summit like a consuming fire. Then Moses disappeared into the cloud as he climbed higher on the mountain. He remained on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. Why was he on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights, and what did it mean for him to go into the cloud? If you'll remember... Moses brought them right up to the bottom of Mount Sinai and God was thundering from Mount Sinai and they said, we ain't going up there. You go up there and you find out what God wants and you come back and tell us. And do you know what that happens in churches every Sunday of the world? 
We don't want to read God's Bible. We don't want to understand what God wants. You stand up there. You give us the answers. And here's what I've said forever since I've been the pastor of this church. If you don't know it, you don't own it. And if all you're living off is what somebody else told you, you will fall every time. You've got to know who God is, and you've got to know what God wants, and you've got to know what God's Word says, and you've got to be able to explain it to other people. Now, you don't have to have all the degrees that are behind my name. There's lots of initials behind my name. All right? BSM, Div, and THD are the initials behind my name, which means I have a bachelor's degree, I have a master's degree, and I have a doctorate. Okay? The only reason I have a doctorate is so I can take this book and other books like it and explain it to you in a way that you can understand it so that you can see the hope and the glory of God in his word. I didn't get it so people could call me Dr. Ron <laughs> or Dr. Yost. I didn't. Right? I wanted to be able to take this word of God and break it down so that you can use it to tell everybody you know how much in love you are with Jesus Christ and why you love him and what a difference he makes in your life. That's why. Why do I stand up in front of the church every Sunday morning and preach God's word? Because I believe somebody's going to get excited about God and going to start changing everything in their world to be what God wants it to be. Why do I talk about the importance of worship? Because worship is not just going and sitting in a seat. Worship is a participatory sport. We worship God out of the fullness that he pours into our lives. And you know what? Some of the times that I've worshipped God have been some of the times when I've been the most broken. Because the only place I could find consolation, the only time I could find fulfillment, was to be on my knees in front of God. Just crying out to him. Some of you have been around here long enough to see that happen right in front of Cumberland Community Church. When I didn't know what to do or which way to turn, and I just got down on my face in front of the church and started praying right after service. Then everybody wants to know, what's wrong, what's wrong, what's wrong, what's wrong? No, I'm just seeking God. I just want to be in his presence. I want to know that what I'm doing is what he wants me to be doing. You know, and we need that. We need that kind of an encounter with God. And we need that kind of an encounter with God every day in some form or fashion. We really do. But let's look at Exodus chapter 40, verses 34 through 38. Exodus 40, verses 34 through 38. This is what it says. Then the cloud covered the tabernacle, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Just like it said that the, the, the smoke of the Lord's presence filled the temple in heaven. It says, the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Moses could no longer enter the tabernacle because the cloud had settled down over it and the glory of the Lord filled the temple, the tabernacle. That was before they had an actual building. This is the building they carried around. It was called the tabernacle. They set it up every time they moved and took it back down. Now, whenever the cloud lifted from the tabernacle, the people of Israel would go on their journey following it. But if the cloud did not rise, they remained where they were until it lifted. The cloud of the Lord hovered over the tabernacle during the day, and at night fire glowed inside the cloud so the whole family of Israel could see it. This continued throughout all their journeys. Wouldn't it be nice? Wouldn't it be nice if we had some place where we could go and know that's where God is? He's here. He's everywhere you go. <coughs> He's there to guide you, to help you to be who He wants you to be. Okay? And back to Revelation 15, or verse 8, it says, The temple was filled with smoke from God's glory and power. No one could enter the temple, just like Moses couldn't enter the tabernacle, because of God's glory. But it says here, until the seven angels had completed pouring out the seven plagues. Now, when we jump into chapter 6, 16, excuse me, we're going to see what those plagues look like. We're going to see that they affect everything that wasn't already affected by the seals and the trumpets. There's going to be a buildup of everything that's already happened. Okay? It's going to be explained more in depth. So, if you want to read ahead next week, for next week, that's fine. We'll be coming back next week to start with chapter 16 and get all the way through chapter 16 next week. This is the last week. Hmm? God will act and 
Go act and all evil will be obliterated. God will act and evil will be obliterated. What a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see, when I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace, when he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land. What a day, a glorious day that will be. I look forward to that day. I look forward to the day when evil is destroyed, Satan is defeated, and all God's people are able to be in his presence. But you know what? I don't think all God's people are accounted for yet. And that's why we work so hard. And that's why we talk about it so much. Any questions, comments? you learn anything? Tell me something you've learned from the book of Revelation so far. We're in chapter 15. There's only a couple chapters left. What have you learned so far? I've read several times that I've learned how to understand that it probably has to order things that go wrong because it didn't really all fall into that place until you explain it. Yeah, it's really not a chronological order. It's just an expanding of everything that he's already been talking about. It's kind of like looking down into a funnel. We're looking in a funnel the wrong way. Right? He starts out small and he takes it out big. He starts out with people calling out for the rocks to fall on them and that hadn't happened yet. Right? And then he starts saying why they're going to start calling for the rocks to fall out on them. Because again, the six seals contain the seven trumpets and the seven trumpets contain the six, or the seven bowls. So it's just an ever-expanding picture of what's coming. Okay, somebody else, what have you learned? Yes, David. Just because we never crash with before. Yeah. That's what I was raised my whole life to believe. You know, you... Now, if you were raised your whole life to believe, what helped you to not believe that anymore? I mean, what caused you not to believe that anymore? And why were you taught that that was the way it was? For you... For the church to be out of here before anything happens we there. Not to um, going to be under God's wrath, but I was led to, like to, to certain scriptures, like the Thessalonians and stuff. But then, actually, honestly, when you said, you know, how are they going to come? No one's there to teach them. And then going through it scripture by scripture. And what do we see in chapter seven, in chapter fourteen, in chapter fifteen? All those who belong to God are escaping the wrath. Yeah, they are. Protected. God's protecting them in the midst of the wrath. The wrath is not for God's people because God's people are sealed and they're protected from God's wrath. The wrath is for the unbelievers. Yeah. And escaping God's wrath, that means that we're going to be in eternity with Him forever. It doesn't mean that we're not going to go that we're not going to go through difficult times. Remember, we said. That even though we may have to be martyred and somebody kills us for the cause of Christ, they can't touch our soul. Yeah, it's an ultimate protection. Right. Somebody else, what have you learned? Well, I'm confused. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, I mean, I was listening to what she's saying, and, and that's what you hear a lot in saying mm-hmm. that the Thessalonians does have a lot to do with that. But the one thing that keeps coming to me, and I've checked different versions in you know, LT, New King James, King James, for like uh, 2 Thessalonians, I think it's chapter 2, 7 and 8, where it talks about um, um, that he, uh, how does it say it? Um, he, until he is taken out of the way, then the son of, then the lawlessness one will be revealed. So who's being taken out of the way? What, what is well, the Holy that? Spirit can't be removed. No. Because so, if the Holy Spirit is removed, nobody comes to Christ. Period. Right. And the church is not removed. But there's something that's holding things back. Right. We don't okay. know what that is. We don't know what that is. There's no definitive answer, definitive answer anywhere that tells us what that is. Now, some people would say that, that, that the church has to be removed in order for all hell to break loose on the earth. We've not seen anywhere through the book of Revelation or through what Jesus said in Matthew that tells us that the church is going to be removed. So we know the Holy Spirit's not going to be removed. We know that Satan is still working right now, and he's going to be working up until the time Jesus comes back. So what is it that needs to be removed? That's an answer that we don't have right now. Well, that's where I got confused because some of the versions... The he would be capitalized, which we all know that capital means God. It's capitalized. 
Well, when is God ever removed from anywhere? No, I understand that. And then is it, well, didn't Jesus say, I'm leaving Christ. the Holy Spirit? No. And he never said, I'm going to take the Holy Spirit away. No, he didn't. It just says he, some versions are capital H-E, some are small H-E, mm -hmm. and some are him. So it's that Second Thessalonians gets confusing when it comes to that. And it also talks about the abomination of desolation when Jesus talks about it, and the man of lawlessness that Paul talks about, and that's the Antichrist. <clears throat> And he's at work, right. okay? But it never says the church is taken out before that happens. You have to string a whole lot of things together to make that happen. Or you got to say that the Holy Spirit's going to be removed. And the answer to that question is, we don't know. Well, the Holy Spirit's not going to be removed because 144,000 are going to be sealed with the Spirit of God. But and again, that's, that's a symbolic people. number. Right. The X amount of people are going to be sealed with the Spirit of God. So they're definitely going to be here in Revelation. But... I know there was a time years ago that I had asked you about, I think it was between Matthew and Luke, and it had to do with the hang with uh, Judas hanging himself. And I called you and I'm like, this doesn't make sense. And you said, I had to go back to Matthew, and it was, you said, it's like the rest of the story. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, how is it that Revelation might not have something like that going on? Well, if you look at the Second Thessalonians chapter 2, starting in verse... Uh, five. Paul is here trying to help people understand that, the, that Jesus has not already come back at that point. Because there were some false teachers saying Jesus was already come back, there's no hope, give up, no sense living for him. And he says in verse 5 of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, don't you remember that I told you what I told you about this when I was with you, and you know what is holding him back, for he can be revealed only when his time comes. Well, who is that? That's the man of lawlessness, right? And they knew what Paul was talking about. For this lawlessness is already working secretly, and it will remain until the one who is holding it back steps out of the way. Then the man of lawlessness will come and be revealed. Well, let's look right here at Revelation chapter 12. Satan is trying to destroy the church. Right. He's trying to destroy God's people. He wars against the angels and is defeated. And then it says he takes his wrath out on all those who serve God. But then he steps aside, and the Antichrist is the next being that you see who is the man of lawlessness that steps in and starts doing Satan's bidding. So, you're saying so Satan steps aside, and the Antichrist begins to do the work of Satan for Satan without Satan being the one getting the credit for it. So and if you read that right there, it says, You know what is holding him back, for he can be revealed only when his time comes. For this lawlessness is already at work secretly, and it will remain secret until the one who is holding it back steps out of the way. So secretly, Satan is working in the world because people don't even believe there is a Satan. Right? But here, everybody's going to know there's an Antichrist. Everybody's going to know there's a false prophet. Everybody. But Satan has to step off to the side and let what he started have its way through what's going on here. And again, we said that's the false trinity. We have Satan, we have the Antichrist, and we have the false prophet. Okay? And when Satan steps aside, and it says right there at the end of chapter 12 of Revelation that he does step aside. Um, let's look at it real quick. Verse 18. The dragon took his stand on the shores beside the sea. He quits, basically. Because right there from chapter verse 13 down to verse 17, it says that he was thrown down to the earth uh, and he, uh, he tried to drown the woman with the flood, but the earth helped her by opening its mouth and swallowing the river that gushed out from the mouth of the dragon. And the dragon was angry at the woman and declared war against the rest of her children, all who keep God's commandments and maintain their testimony for Jesus. Then the dragon took his stand on the shore beside the sea. Then I saw a beast rising up out of the sea. Satan steps aside so that all the hell can break loose on the earth. Because we can't take, the, if you take the church out, there's nobody to share God's good news. <coughs> if the Holy Spirit is out, that means the Holy Spirit is not everywhere present. But we know that God, in the form of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, are everywhere present. So, in order for the man of lawlessness, the Antichrist, to come on the scene, Satan has to step out of the way. And that is not until that time comes. At the very end, right? When his time comes. At the very end, Satan's going to think he's won. 
He's going to step aside. He's going to turn all this loose on the world. And the next thing you know, he's going to think he's won. Just like he did when he thought he defeated Christ on the cross. You see, he's so proud. And he wants to be God so badly. That he's going to do everything he can up until he's destroyed. Even though he knows he's going to be destroyed, he still thinks he can stop from being destroyed. Okay, so then in the versions, what NLT versus King, my King James says, that, what 2 Thessalonians 2 7, for the mystery of lawlessness, said this is the whole mystery that you're talking about? There's no mystery to lawlessness. It tells us no, that lawlessness, lawlessness has been at work. The mystery of it. But there's no mystery to lawlessness. To where people are saying 2 Thessalonians, the he is the church or whatever, but you're. Kidding. I'm saying that until. Whatever Paul's talking about, whether I'm saying this is a possibility, Satan being stepped out of the way and the Antichrist coming on the scene is when all hell breaks loose. I can see that being a mystery. But that's not a mystery. It's not a mystery because John tells us lawlessness is already at work, Antichrist is already at work. Paul tells us lawlessness is at work, Antichrist is already at work. Yeah. But there's coming a day when Antichrist is going to reign supreme. Yeah. In order for that to happen, Satan has to kind of step off to the side. And then all hell must, all war, all false worship begins to happen. The abomination of desolation. Well, the abomination of desolation happened in the first or second century, or before Christ, when Antiochus Epiphanes came in and set up the Roman altar over the top of the altar in the Jewish temple and started sacrificing pigs on the altar right in the temple. That was one of the, the, the one of the, the manifestations of the, the, the abomination of desolation. So Antichrist has been going on for a long time, but one day, this system or person or whoever it is that is the actual Antichrist at the end time is going to be the one who ushers in what we would call all hell breaking loose on earth for everybody who's a believer. Okay? And if we go back there to 2 Thessalonians, just real quick. Uh, the man of lawlessness will be revealed, but the Lord Jesus will slay him with the breath of his mouth and destroy him by the splendor of his coming. And we're going to find that in Revelation chapter 19. Okay? So whatever it is, Paul says, don't be fooled. He said, I told you what it was, but he doesn't tell us what it is. He doesn't, he says, he doesn't tell us exactly what it is. All right? But one of the things that we can look at as we read through the book of Revelation is in order for the false prophet and the Antichrist to reign supreme and be the people of all us, and Satan has to step aside and let them do what they're going to do. He's the power behind it, but nobody's going to talk about Satan anymore. Because this is going to look like real. They're going to be, remember, they're going to be able to do miracles that mirror what Jesus did. And these people are going to think that's the true Messiah. And he's going to have his own false prophet and a statue that speaks. And all this magical mumbo-jumbo stuff that people are going to say, wow, this must be the real thing. And they're going to buy right into it. I'm not saying that that's exactly what Paul's talking about, but I'm saying if you look at this, you can see what he's talking about right there. Okay? And what else have we learned? Take another minute. What else have we learned? Well, if you know it all, then you'll have to pick, come up with the notes for the next seven chapters and mm -hmm. you guys can teach it. How about that? Next six chapters. You guys can teach it. Well, I learned just from what I was told before. It's a book of hope more than something to be scared of. For God's people, it is a book of hope. Yes, perhaps. For everybody that refuses God, it's the God, it's the undiluted wrath of God coming. Yeah, because they're not going to understand it. If you don't read the book of Revelation, which in the beginning it says, Blessed are those who read, the blessing is the hope and the understanding that, you know, even if we die, we're going to be with Christ. And we need to know but that we can't have we every nitpicking detail. Because it's a metaphor and it's an apocalyptic language and, and it definitely does not ever deter from the message of the gospel, which is the gospel of hope and life and health and salvation. But it also gives us stuff to be looking for that other people aren't even going to be looking for. Yeah, but we can't just be like the dispensationalists, the newspaper preachers who pick up a newspaper and they pick up the Bible and they say, here it is right here. We can't do that. No. We know that it's going to happen. 
Right. We know that it's going to be worse than anybody's ever expected it to be, but, but we're going to be less our focus is time. not on looking to see what's going on and saying, look what's going on. It's to help people get saved before it happens. Yeah. Taylor, were you going to say something else? Um, kind of to backtrack, too, we're considered the bride of Christ. Correct. So brides are female. In Thessalonians it says, he who now restrains anyway. He. But brides of Christ are female. The church is considered female. Right, so that doesn't, yeah, the church is not taken out. There's no place yes. that says the church uh -huh. is taken out. Nowhere. See what I mean? Nowhere does it say the church is taken out. So, all right. Well, thank you guys. Um, I know we only got through eight verses tonight, but I really wanted us to go back and get a refresher because we've been gone for two weeks. And one of the things about studying God's Word is if you don't remember where you've been, you can't get started again where you are. Okay? Uh, so let's pray. Anybody have a prayer request? I just pray cold. Okay. It was attacked by a dog. I saw that on the prayer post. Yeah. Um, and also Cody's great-grandpa. And Cody's great-grandpa's passing. Okay. So. My sister. Your sister, how's she doing after being off the ventilator for a while? She's still on the ventilator. They put her back on? still trying to wean her off of it. Okay. She's about the same. Okay. Well, I want to pray for the people that you know who don't know Jesus. And do you know the best chance you're going to have to talk to them is to start praying for them. <clears throat> praying for the lost people keeps them on our mind. And as we pray for them and keep them on our mind, God opens doorways for us to talk to them. And you know what? They don't always want to hear what we've got to say, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't say it. <clears throat> Does that make sense to everybody? If you're ashamed of me in front of me, I'll be ashamed of you in front of my Father. That's one thing that I can't let go out of my mind. All right? That's what, Father, we thank you for this day, for this time together. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the hope that's there. Thank you that everywhere we see something about to happen, John gives us a little glimpse of your glory a glimpse of your protection, a glimpse of your care and watch and concern for those who belong to you. Father, if we're alive on the earth, when all this happens, we'll be prepared to know that we need to live for you in the face of whatever comes. But if we're in that group standing there singing the song of Moses and the Lamb, oh my, what a time that'll be. So Lord, I pray that you would be glorified, that you would be honored, that we would not argue over your word with anybody, because there are a lot of people out there who aren't believers, who sometimes know the word of God better than believers do. And they've always got a trap set, just like the, like the Pharisees did. And Father, we need to realize that when we give a reason for the hope that lies within us, it's because of our surrender, our understanding of who you are. You don't call us to argue with anybody, but you call us to discuss with people your goodness, your grace, your mercy, your love, your forgiveness. And Father, I pray that as we do that, that you be glorified, and that we would see the people that we love and care about, and maybe new people that we haven't met yet who are going to bring into our lives, come to understand what a great God you are. Thank you for the questions that are asked in this room, because Lord, when we have unanswered questions, we, we just don't know which way to go next, and Father, we need to research your word and we need to come to the place sometimes where we just can say, I don't know what that means. I don't understand that. Uh, and Lord, as I said tonight, I just offered a, a possible exception to what Paul was talking about because we've already excluded the two most co overt things that somebody might be talking about, which is the church and the Holy Spirit. And neither one of them can be removed because lost people won't come to you. Lord, but people who believe that the church is not going to be here believe there's some separate, special salvation for people. And that goes against what the Word said. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. And when somebody comes to Jesus, they are no longer Jewish. They are no longer anything else but Christians. So, Father God, I pray that you would help us to focus on what's important, that we would help people understand, and we would be willing to give a reason for why we live for you and why we love you and that we would always engage people in conversations in a way that we can say, you know, I don't know the answer to that, but I'll find out and then we can talk about it some more. Lord, when we enter conversations like that and when we season our conversations with salt, it makes people want to come back and want to talk and Lord, I believe that everybody in this room has somebody in their life that they know 
that doesn't belong to you and hasn't met you and has not surrendered their life to you, Father. And we know that your word says, and Jesus even said it himself, a prophet has no honor in their own country because those people who are closest to us know who we've been before Christ. And they've seen us struggle in our walk with Christ. And they don't believe that we're any different than who we were. But God, thank you that we can be forgiven. Thank you that your grace and your mercy abounds through our lives. And Father, I pray that somebody would see in us the reason that they should follow you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. <coughs> All right, we'll be in chapter 16 next week. <coughs>